Ladies and gentlemen, at this time we're going to begin the funeral services of Lori Weinberg. By way of introduction, just a friend of the family, not a clergy. We welcome the over 50 screens that are watching. Those of you online, the family appreciates your presence here. And for those of you who are here, we ask you take a moment to be sure that your cell phones have been turned off. We begin with the 23rd Psalm, which is on your service folder, which we can read together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We read from Ecclesiastes, for everything there is a season, a time for every experience under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, time to keep, a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak. As at this time, I invite the family to come forward. Welcome and thank you all for attending, both near and far. I'm Damon, Lori's son-in-law. We're all here today because of a wonderful lady who recently left us. We have come to offer comfort to the family and to each other. I admit that most of you knew her longer than I did, and of that I am envious. However, no one of us ever knew every aspect of Lori, so I would like to offer up some background before introducing the rest of the family and their stories. Today is Lori's 82nd birthday. Not that 82 that easily jumps to mind. She lived quite happily on her own. She was still working part-time because she liked to be useful. She drove herself wherever she needed to be uh, without being a danger to anyone else, except maybe that one time that she blew through a toll lane thinking it was an eye pass and took out the gate arm. <laughs> no, not the 82 that statisticians and pharma companies would peddle, but rather a bright, cheery, full of life grandmother who wanted to be every part of living. That is the woman that I want to tell you about. She acknowledged that there is pain in every life, but explicitly did not want us to wallow in our sorrow at her departure. She wanted a celebration of her life. She wanted her family and friends to gather in laughter of fond memories shared and joy in the good fortune of making them. She lived all of her life in Chicago, Skokie, and most recently, Wheeling. Uh, this did not stop her from traveling and enjoying her spa retreats. Among other roles, she worked as a phlebometer. I owe her 20 bucks. Worked as a phlebotomist, a meeting planner, and an office manager. But those were just means to paying the bills of life. What brought her joy was the outdoors, taking a stroll in nature, her grandchildren, her friends, planning family gatherings, seeing her daughters remain close as adults, reading, and those spa vacations with the soothing gongs and most recently, uh, playing canasta and doing puzzles. Lori was organized. 
her, house, her home was tidy, her pictures cataloged, and even her future documented. For those of you who know her girls, you can appreciate that they have come by their gifts directly. Let me explain. <clears throat> In a moment of crisis, while the family was reeling from this sudden trauma, Lori came through again. Many years ago, she had planned out her funeral and other end-of-life arrangements. Then, five years ago, she updated and distributed them all again. This in itself was enormously helpful to dear loved ones in a whirlwind of denial. But Lori didn't stop there. Lori's nephew, Jay, having been through this dreadful scenario, offered a recommendation on a funeral home. Upon arrival at this new to us location, we were greeted by David at the door with Lori's files in hand. Because you see, she had been here six years earlier and laid out exactly what she wanted. Leaving only a few decisions on recent updates to her grieving children. So yes, Lori was thinking of everyone here that she was leaving behind when she planned out today's details. On that note, Lori is survived by her daughters, Carrie and Donna, their husbands, Ed and Damon, her grandchildren, Isabella and Will, her step-grandchildren, Sydney, Tyler, and Lauren, her grand dogs, Thorky and Indy, her sister, Marion, her brother, Ron, sister-in-law, Judy, her nieces and nephews, Pam, Jay, Sherry, Jenny, and Noah, and her grandnieces, Kelly, Miranda, Tara, Erica, and Alexis. Because today we are celebrating Lori's life, yeah, you will get to hear some funny and heartwarming stories about her well, great lady. And that I'm lucky because I get to go first. Lori welcomed me, my children, and my extended family into her family, as her family. No questions asked. She treated my children as her grandchildren celebrating birthdays and achievements, uh, introducing them to her love of theater, uh, and always taking the time to sit with them individually at family gatherings to see what they were up to and to offer some of this famous Lori advice wherever she felt she could be of use. The merger of our families was so complete that every summer for the past few years, she would visit with my father and his husband in Indiana to spend a night or two with them and enjoying the quiet countryside, long walks, watching wildlife, learning to make jam, among other things. I'd like to read you something that my father wrote that I believe totally exemplifies who Lori was to us. Now, as a note, in Yiddish, your parents and your spouse's parents would be makathunum. Lori had a unique spin on this when she referred to my dad and David. The following note is from my father to Lori. I hope I do it justice. <laughs> Our dear Makatuchi, from your Makatu men, thank you for making such a large place in your heart and family for us. You showed us how a non-traditional extended family partied, shared, and loved. Thank you. You reminded us on each visit to the cottage of the wonder of nature around us. We lived in it and frequently didn't see it. On your visits and those special overnights, you loved the sights and smells of the outdoors, the growth of the trees and the flowers. You humbled us with your simple love of the world. Thank you. Thank you for raising a beautiful daughter with grounded values and the ability to open her arms in love. In love. Through her, we became your very own Makatumen. Love, David and Bill. <clears throat> I have so much more that I would like to share. However, I need to hand this over to Jay, uh, Lori's nephew.
Thank you, Damon. Um, I would also like to thank everyone for coming today and also express our gratitude to those who couldn't be here but are streaming this service online. I'm going to keep what I have to say relatively brief in part because I think there may be a lot of people here who have things that they'd like to say. And if you don't feel comfortable talking today, then that's completely okay too. When something like this happens and we are faced with such an unexpected and sudden loss, you simply don't know what to say. You cannot understand how this is happening. If I were to talk to you about a stranger who would have turned 82 today, and if I told you she lived a full life, she had a lot of friends and a loving family, and she passed quickly without suffering, you might think that sounds like an honorable tribute of that person's life. But in this case, this is not acceptable. It's not good enough. Aunt Lori had too many more years to live. We were supposed to have more time with her and we should have gotten some kind of a warning when that time was running out. That's the way it's supposed to work. Anyone who knew her would agree her age was irrelevant and it was her spirit that mattered. When Aunt Lori and I would finish any conversation, she would always end it the same way. She would always look at me and she would say, well, I enjoyed our little talk. <laughs> She loved being a part of our lives. She was genuinely interested in what was happening and what we were doing. And she always wanted to see us again as soon as we could make more plans. So I can stand up here and I can tell you everything you already know about her. But I think we each have our own stories. And as we come to terms with this, we will be sharing them together. Aunt Lori will be remembered for her love for life and how she nurtured her relationships. We will carry with us her vibrant soul, her smile that lit up the room, and her endless positive energy. We will never forget her love and commitment to her family and how it meant everything to her and how it shaped her. The very fact that I'm a 56-year-old man and she insisted that I still either call her Aunt, Auntie, or Aunt Lori speaks volumes to this. She gave me her unwavering support for as long as I can remember, dating back to when I was a little boy. I know this all seems unfair and it seems like we've been cheated because we have lost a friend, a sister, a parent, a grandparent, a cousin, an aunt, a coach, and, on, and an all-around positive influence in all of our lives. The sad truth is that we are now a statistic Hundreds of thousands of other families and millions of friends have unfairly lost people over this past year. And now for us, it's personal because we've lost someone who was vitally important to each and every one of us. Aunt Lori was like her own tree of life. She reached out in all directions and her branches touched everybody. She recently told me that she was living her best life. She was doing the things she wanted and spending time with the people she loved. And that's something that we should celebrate. The tag at the bottom of my email in my signature is a quote from a Robert Frost poem. And it says, the only way around is through. And what this means is that sometimes we have to walk through the pain. Sometimes there's no other path. So there's nothing we can do now to change the fact that Aunt Lori is gone. We would willingly give up anything or pay any price if we could make it different, but we can't. So what we can do now is carry her spirit with us for the rest of our lives, because that's how a person lives on. So if I may, I just have one other thing I'd like to say. I'm grateful to Carrie and Donna and Ed and Damon for letting me go to the hospital with them when Aunt Lori was taken off of life support. As much as I wanted to go to say goodbye, 
I was afraid I was going to walk into a hospital room where I was too uncomfortable and I wouldn't be able to stay. But what happened was instead, I walked into a room that I didn't want to leave. So I'm telling you this because I think it's important. I think you should know that that room was filled with compassion and warmth. And in the midst of this unbelievably difficult situation, there was comfort in that room. And Aunt Lori knew that she was loved. Who am I introducing? Mom, right? Lori has been in my life for 81 years. When we were young, we were not very close. She stayed to herself most of the time. As years went by, we got closer. And in the past many years, we were very close with each other. She always told me that I had so many friends and she didn't have any. Then she joined different groups and little by little, she had more friends than I did. When our father passed away, it was up to Lori and I to take care of our mother. That's when we started to do everything together. When I was sick a few months ago, she was a huge help to me, and she stayed in touch with Pam and Jay. She had time for everyone. I did not drive for a long time, so Lori took me wherever I had to go, mostly doctors and hospitals. She called me every morning to say, checking in, and we would talk for a while. I feel like part of me went with her. To my young, vibrant, fun, pretty sister, rest in peace. The one thing I have never doubted in my life is that I was loved. Through words and actions, mom made sure of that. She and my dad divorced when she was in her mid-30s, so it was just mom, Donna, and me for a long time. And maybe that explains why we're all so close now. It also makes it all the more difficult to have lost her. She's been in our lives a lot and for a long time, so this loss is painfully felt. I talked to my mom every few days. I'd call her as I was walking our dog or driving around running errands. She'd hop on her exercise bike and ride as we talked. I'd tell her about the kids, our house, my friends, and whatever was going on in my life. She told me about her job, which she loved, her friends, her canasta, her puzzles, and the books and movies she read and watched. Sometimes after these conversations, She'd do some Googling and send me some articles or any other information she thought would be helpful. She would also share cute animal videos on Facebook. She put them on her main page, but many of them were really just for me. I'd like them, sometimes five in a day, and she'd email and tell me, I knew you would like that. It was for you. I knew. My mom taught me strength, resilience, independence, to love animals, and to see the beauty in nature. She was strong and independent and didn't seem to be afraid of anything. 
She learned to do things herself and taught me and Donna to do the same. She wanted us to be independent and self-sufficient from the get-go. She always told us, don't wait for a man to help you. You have to learn to take care of yourselves. Occasionally, however, she needed a little help. Sometimes when there was a problem, like a toilet she couldn't fix or a closet door falling off the tracks, she would shake it and say, please God, I'm a divorced woman. <laughs> I can't remember but if, if it worked, but it always made us laugh. She was into self-help long before it was popular. I think I was 10 the first time she hypnotized me and was horrified when it worked. <laughs> she also taught me to meditate and we were always talking about our feelings. It was interesting growing up with her. She was the cool mom and a little quirky. She didn't believe in rules. We had natural consequences. If you didn't want to bring a jacket and it was cold out, you shivered. If you forgot your lunch, you didn't eat. Not so bad, but we wanted rules. Everyone else had rules. I begged for a curfew in high school. She finally told me my curfew was 2 a.m., <laughs> which was hours after everyone else had to be home. That was her version of rules. <laughs> One time she went out of town for work, so my friends and I threw a huge toga party at the house. When she found out about it later, she wasn't mad, she just laughed and asked why we hadn't thrown it when she was home so she could be there. <laughs> and then there was Michael. <laughs> when I was a senior in high school, I went on a spring break vacation to Florida with my friends Devra and Keiko, who are here today. <laughs> While there, we met three Swedish guys who we spent a lot of time with. A couple of weeks after we returned, Keiko called me frantically to tell me that one of them was flying to Chicago to see her. Keiko had a boyfriend and didn't know what to do with this guy from Florida. He needed somewhere to stay. She said to me, your mom is cool. Can he stay with you? <laughs> I didn't know, so we asked my mom, and she, stayed. she said he could stay for one night. Who does that? So Keiko dropped Michael Massey off on our doorstep and left. After the first night, my mom said he was nice and he could stay for a few days. He stayed for several years. <laughs> Devra, Keiko, and I went off to college, and he continued living at my house with my mom and Donna long after we were gone. Actually, Donna went off to college, and he was still there. <laughs> he kept in touch with mom for years. She became even more of a fixture in my life after the birth of my children, Isabella and Will. She was there for both of their births, then came to visit them every weekend for the next 12 years because it was important to her to have a relationship with them. She would come into the house, say hello to me and Ed, and then head into the basement with the kids. They played hide and seek. They threw balls at her. They drove Will's cars around and they read. She didn't care. She was just happy to be with them. It tapered off a little as the kids got older, but her desire to connect with them did not. She texted, she called, she sent cards for every holiday, and sent countless camp letters. She loved being with us and helping out. All I had to do was ask, and if I didn't, she volunteered. She babysat both the kids and the dog regularly, and would cancel her own plans at a moment's notice to do so. But she also went above and beyond. On one particularly difficult day when I was a new mom, I called her and told her I felt like throwing the baby out the window. <laughs> Not really but she left her work and was at my house less than an hour later to give me the break that I desperately needed. She accompanied me on several 15-hour round-trip drives to take the kids to farm camp in Ohio. She didn't drive much, she just liked to keep me company. When we were moving into our newly built house in Michigan, she went out there with me and we spent several days mopping, dusting, placing furniture, and making beds. It was hard work, but she wanted to help. We actually laughed a lot and had a good time and it was fun to share it with her. And then a couple of years ago, I had surgery, and she insisted on coming to the house to take care of me. She spent most of the time napping on the couch next to me, but she was there. She also loved taking care of her grand dog, Indy. Indy stayed with her when we went on vacation, and sometimes just because. She would send me daily updates and photos and videos of herself bowling and playing hide and seek with the dog. The other day, I heard my husband, Ed, describe my mom as an extroverted introvert. She loved being home and alone or out in nature, but when she was out, she was all in. She loved to be in the middle of things and loved connecting with people. She talked to everyone, took the time to get to know them, and really genuinely cared. 
I was going through the contacts on her cell phone this weekend, and in the notes section for many friends and acquaintances, she had detailed notes about their kids, their grandkids, their dogs, their jobs, their vacations, and their health ailments so she could check back in. She really cared. Her photos were filled with pictures of the things that made her happy or brought her joy. There were images of her friends, grandchildren, grand dogs, and random images of things in nature that she had come across and thought were beautiful, like colorful flowers and old and interesting trees and just blue skies. I started going through my own photos in preparation for today, and what struck me was that she was everywhere with us. No matter the event, she was there. Birthdays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, Passover, the 4th of July, band and chorus concerts, ballet recitals, track meets, and even random last minute Saturday night get togethers. She'd say, don't do it without me. And then she'd jump in her car and run downtown. The other thing that was interesting about the photos was that she was always right in the middle of everything. She's often in the center of the group and always with a huge and beautiful smile. She loved being in the middle of things and didn't let her age or anything else slow her down and was willing to try almost anything. She hated to miss any event or opportunity and wanted to do whatever we were doing. Some interesting things that she did between the ages of 65 and 82, I might add. She rode Will's electric dirt bikes. She hiked in the woods. She canoed. She went, water, went down water slides. She drove go-karts and bumper boats. She threw a hatchet. She played ping pong and was better than me, according to Will. She climbed the sand dunes, she walked 5Ks, and she invented the Gramman ball, jumping into swimming pools with the kids or into the lake off of the roof of our friend's pontoon boat. She was everywhere and doing it all. The only place she wasn't was the kitchen. She liked to be helpful, so she dried dishes a lot, but she hated to cook and it was not a secret. Donna and I grew up on her three famous dishes, which were Cheez-It coated chicken, salmon patties, and sweet and sour meatballs. I recently remarked to her that it was odd that those were her three dishes because all of them were so labor intensive and just strange. One of the few times she strayed from these dishes was a Christmas brunch. It was the first time she was making a meal for Ed. She presented a dish that we all questioned when she presented it due to the runny nature of the eggs. They were dripping off of our forks. She insisted she followed the recipe, but a few days later she admitted that she'd made a mistake. We'd all eaten raw eggs for brunch. <laughs> Needless to say, Christmas brunch is now at my house. Many of these experiences were during our annual summer vacations in Michigan. At first when we rented a house there, and later when we bought our own. She loved coming to visit and would sit outside on the screen porch looking at the beauty and enjoying the sounds of nature. She walked for miles on the side roads in our neighborhood where it was quiet. She felt peaceful there and loved that she belonged. It is our happy place and was hers as well. My mom was a simple person. She would be absolutely bowled over by the outpouring of love and grief at her loss, by the food, calls, cards, texts, and notes on our Facebook pages. She would be thankful that so many of you are looking out for all of us we are humbled by it, and to everyone, we say thank you. Everyone else has been able to hold it together so far. I may break that streak. <laughs> I put off writing this for as long as I could because somehow writing it down, writing down memories of my mother to be shared during the celebration of her life might somehow make this all real. There have been so many emotions this past week, fear, shock, disbelief, denial, anger, sadness. I haven't quite made it to acceptance yet, but I know I'll get there. My mom was not one for sadness. She always told us that she wanted her life to be about joy and laughter. And to the extent I can make that possible on this day, I will try. 
Having spent the better part of 53 years with my mom, either in person or on the phone, I would like to share a few of the many, many memories and stories about her, hopefully ones that would make her laugh. My mom always said I was the easy one, a happy baby, laughing, lovey, and she nicknamed me Donna Doolittle. She nicknamed a lot of people. I feel like asking people to raise their hands if they have a Lori nickname, but alas, most people are on Zoom today, uh, but you know who you are. My mom was always there for carrying me, whether it was for emotional support, whether we needed someone to talk to because we were bored, which we always were while driving or walking our dogs. She would always drop whatever she was doing for us. I remember one time I was in my 20s working on Michigan Avenue, and there was a huge snowstorm. I used to park my car near Lincoln Park Zoo and take the bus the last mile or so into work. There were no cell phones back then, so I called my mom from work and asked her to meet me at my car with a shovel, <laughs> providing a rough description of my car's location. I trudged a mile in a blizzard to get to my car, where, of course, she was already waiting for me. My car was completely buried in several feet of snow, but she brought two shovels and helped me to dig it out and stayed with me until it was free. Oh, and she had a cold during all of this. She never said no to us. My mom was very invested in my work life and career. I'm in sales, which can be stressful. Uh, just about every time we talked, she would always ask me, did you close any deals today? And if the answer was no, she would say, don't worry, Donna, you're a star. It will come, you always succeed. Early in my career, I remember my mom coming to my workplace for some reason, and she wanted to meet my then manager. She marched into his office to tell him how lucky he was to have me, and did he know, <laughs> did he know that he had a star on his team? <laughs> it was slightly horrifying as a new employee, <laughs> but great to know that my mom had my back. My mom loved to give advice. She would always say, listen to me, I'm your mother. No one ever told me this, you should listen. And then would come any of the following. Make sure to eat right, don't eat so much junk food. Make sure to exercise, I'm telling you, if you don't exercise now, you will regret it. Save your money, make sure you can take care of yourself, be independent. <laughs> and then there's one that I can still hear her saying because I heard it so, so often. Actions have consequences. <laughs> the number of times I was told those are the consequences because I did something stupid. I think Carrie and I cringe thinking about those words. Of course, that does not stop us from saying them to our own kids and stepkids because, you know, it's true. <laughs> and the one simple momism that has gotten me through more trying times than anything else, maybe the simplest yet most powerful thing she's ever said that applies in any difficult situation. This too shall pass. I've been thinking about that one a lot this week. As I was rereading this, I felt I had to add in another trauma that our mom inflicted on us as children that we carried into adulthood. Our mom used to whistle for us as kids. <laughs> we would be playing outside and we would hear the whistle and we would come running home. I'm gonna try it. <laughs> To this day, and it has happened recently, if I hear that whistle, I will automatically turn around and look for my mom. <laughs> my mom was welcoming to everyone. Uh, my parents divorced when I was eight years old. My dad didn't really have any other family, and rather than holding a grudge, my mom included my dad in everything we did as children. Birthdays, holidays, parties, everything. She always put our welfare and happiness first. My dad was remarried to Diane in the mid-90s, and my mom insisted that Diane be included in everything, even when we celebrated with my mom's side of the family. My dad died over 12 years ago, but Diane remains a very close part of our oddball family. In fact, today is not only my mom's birthday, but it's also Diane's. Uh, she is in California and unfortunately couldn't make it today, but I think she's watching, so happy birthday, Diane. <laughs> um, my mom loved to give speeches, whether it was for her job, a volunteer organization, someone's birthday or wedding, or one of her ladies' lunches, where she loved to celebrate her friends and tell them all what she loved about them. But one speech that many of you may never have heard of, the one that made her notorious, was the speech she gave at my wedding. 
where she insisted on going first because she had been working on this speech for weeks and she wanted to set the bar high for any speakers who followed. She started by sharing her joy at my having found Damon. Damon is smart, tall, good looking, and in her words, the whole package. And she went on. Damon came into our family, not as an individual, but as a package deal. His kids came into our lives, as did the rest of his family, including his dad and David. She then took a dramatic pause, walked up to Damon, <laughs> put her hand on his shoulder, looked at him and said, Damon, I want you to know, you've got a great package too. <laughs> what made it funnier was that she had no idea what, why everyone was either laughing <laughs> or was mouth open in shock. It wasn't, it wasn't until the next day at brunch when we were talking about it did she say, I don't know why everyone was laughing. I think it was something sexual, but I don't know why it was so funny. And I said, do you know what the word package is slang for? And she said, no. Is it like his junk? And I said, yes, it is like his junk. Of course, I asked why she knew the word junk, and she said that my nephew, Will, eight at the time, had taught her that word. <laughs> She still didn't understand why it was funny until she pulled out her speech, read it, and said, oh, I said he had a great package. <laughs> but that was my mom, hilarious, but didn't realize it half the time. My mom loved to hear about my travels. And as I was telling her stories, her first question was always, did you laugh a lot? And she always wanted to hear everything in detail and see all the pictures. Only my mother would want to see all the pictures. She always requested a detailed itinerary of our flights, hotels, and activities before we left because she, would like to, she liked to watch us on a flight app so she could make sure that we got everywhere safely. Into my 50s, my mom still had to make sure that I was safe. She loved to read the travel blogs I write when we take big trips, and she always wanted to be the first one to get the link so she could track how many people had read it. She would report back whenever she saw the view counter had gone up, and I had to tell her that if she kept going back to check, she was probably the reason the counter kept ticking up. <laughs> Some of you may know that I had left for Alaska when all of this happened. I only spent one day in Alaska before rushing home, but ended up writing a blog about the situation with the intention of reading it to my mom when she woke up. Unfortunately, I never did get to read it to her, but she would have loved to know that her story was the highest reader count to date. While she had a, a tremendous amount of good advice, there were times that she just provided an unfiltered view of her, of her opinion in a particular situation. One of my favorites was when she told me after reading one of my blogs that my use of the phrase holy crap in the blog was unladylike and made me sound uneducated and I really should take more care with my word choice. <laughs> There was a whole back and forth discourse on the appropriateness of the phrase, which I still wholly support. This was especially hilarious because the comment was in response to Damon and my first view of the 130 foot bridge we would shortly be bungee jumping off of in New Zealand. And I can assure you that holy crap was most certainly not what actually came out of our mouths. <laughs> There's not enough time to share the impact my mom has had on my life. And I am just one person. From the letters we've received throughout this horrific ordeal, one thing has been clear. My mom was loved by so many people whom she positively affected in so many ways. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Almost everything I am is because of the love of my mom, the lessons she taught us, her values, her ethics, and her unwavering support for everything I did. On my mom's last day, I had the opportunity to speak to her alone for a few minutes, and I hoped that she could hear me. I told her that Carrie and I would be okay. There was nothing left that I had to tell her because I've always shared every detail of my life with her. There were no regrets about missing time together because she was always with us. 
I told her that she raised us to be strong, independent women surrounded by spouses, family, and friends who love us. And while we will miss her beyond belief, we will all be okay. When I think of my Grammy, I think first of her boundless love for her family, her friends, the outdoors, and so many other things. This love has defined our relationship for the 19 years of my life. And with that in mind, I'd like to tell you a bit about what, was, what it was like to have Lori as a grandmother. As a child, before I understood anything else about her, I understood that she was kind, gentle, and selfless. She was the person who spent hours teaching me meditation techniques on the floor of my bedroom when I told her I had trouble sleeping, which I still use to this day. The person who made me and my brother grilled cheese while we took every pillow, blanket, and chair in her house to make blanket forts. The person who Will and I would snuggle with in bed when she slept over, and we would beg her for another story about, famously, <laughs> a kiwi fruit that went on many adventures. She was always looking for ways to enrich her grandchildren's lives. Through the years, she took us to the beautiful botanic gardens and to dozens of plays at the Marriott Theater, exclaiming, yes, I've finally found something your parents don't do with you. <laughs> she was everything a grandmother was supposed to be and more, except for a good cook. You already heard about how she almost poisoned my entire family with raw eggs, but Will just reminded me how, on another infamous occasion, she told us how excited she was for us to try her new healthy pumpkin soup recipe. We watched in horror as she chopped up a whole pumpkin and threw it in her Vitamix blender while telling us how the friction of the blade spinning would heat the soup up on its own without the need for a pesky stove or a microwave. The soup was definitely lukewarm and frothy and definitely tasted like a raw whole pumpkin, which it was. <laughs> But looking back, not only is this pretty hilarious, but we know it's the thought that counted, the fact that she was always going out of her way to make my brother and I feel loved and cared for. More recently, some of our activities have matured into longer conversations about our lives, girl time, she liked to call it, which I always look forward to. Sitting at a table overlooking the green field at Pinstripe's restaurant or at the edge of my bed or in my college dorm room when she came to visit, or even over the phone. I would tell her about school, my friends, my plans for the future, and she would tell me about Canasta, her many outings, her friends, and the latest puzzle she'd been working on. And she would offer words of advice from her years of experience, most of which could be boiled down to be who you want to be, do what makes you happy, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. If we were on the phone, the call would always conclude with both of us saying, I love you, to which she would say, would you look at that? We're in love. <laughs> and I would laugh and make plans to call her again soon. I know that not everyone is so lucky to share such a close relationship with their grandma, and I am endlessly thankful for these times. Our more grown-up conversations have illuminated the fact that not only was she a loving grandmother, but a complete person with her own unique challenges and life experiences, most of which took place before I was even alive. In the past few days, listening to stories from my mom and my Auntie Donna, poring over old photos and reading the memories her friends recount of her, have continuously proven how her youthful spirit and endless love permeated all of her interactions and touched so many people. When I learned of her passing, Oddly, the first thing that came to mind was a memory of her telling me, on many occasions, that life is like a conveyor belt. You get on, you go for a ride, and then you get off. Her view of life and death was stunningly matter of fact, and I suppose she's right. That said, I'm realizing now that it doesn't account for how a person can continue to live on in the memories, the stories, and the love people have for them long after they've passed. This gathering, a celebration of life as she wanted it to be called, 
is a testament to the many different ways that she loved all of us. This is the way that I will always remember, and I think that it will be her legacy. Good afternoon. I'm Ed, and as Larry called me, Eddie. Uh, as many of you know, I'm Carrie's husband. I'd like to close by reading a poem that Lori wrote a number of years ago. It was one of her favorite pieces. But before I read the poem, I'd like to say a few words. Carrie and I have been together for more than 25 years, and Lori was a big part of our lives. From the beginning, during the first year that Carrie and I dated, I got to know Lori as we planned Carrie's 30th birthday party. I hosted and, Car and Lori planned. Lori was an exceptional planner. And she left no detail unattended, especially if there was a detail that could make her girls happy. As you can imagine, the preparation including, included all the normal party planning things, food, drinks, entertainment, which I expected. What I didn't expect were the couple of home remodeling suggestions that were offered and that were made in order to make everything just right for Carrie. From this experience, I began to understand how much Lori loved Carrie and Donna and that Lori would be a big part of the package that came with a life with Carrie. When the kids were young, we would see Lori almost every Sunday. We would usually have a nice family dinner, and Lori was always invited and often attended. She would stop by our house mid-afternoon and let herself in, whistle to announce her arrival, which excited the kids and Indy, our puppy, put on the slippers that she kept at our house, and spend a few hours with the kids doing whatever they wanted to do, then have dinner with us before heading home. The kids relished their time with their Grammy, and her visits gave all of us an opportunity to stay in touch, to talk about current events, politics, and countless other topics. But to Lori, the topics never mattered. She was most interested in just spending time with us. More recently, we spent most of our time together in Michigan. She loved the natural beauty, the ability to, to spend extended periods of time with us and the kids and the opportunity to get to know Will and Izzy's friends. She would tell us how much she loved her second floor treehouse bedroom in our guest house, where she opened all the windows so that she could listen to the birds and the sound of the breeze blowing through the trees. When she wasn't walking the dogs or connecting with her friends or her mahetunum, Bill and David, that lived nearby, we would find her reading or napping on the couch on the screen porch. We expected to have many, many more years with her. I think the pandemic was particularly hard for her, although she loved her independence and time with her thoughts, books, and nature, she always had a full calendar and needed to spend time with the people she loved. Having her attend some of our recent year-end holidays and birthdays by FaceTime was just not the same. We were looking forward to seeing her more regularly again as things began to normalize. We will miss her terribly. Now to her poem. It's titled, The Tree and Me. She wrote it in 1995, when she was about the same age as Carrie is today. The Tree and Me. I walk through this quiet, life-filled forest and find you, a friend, in this delicious green cover. Your powerful stature and weathered bark hearken to me. I touch you, study you, talk to you. Slowly, I come to see how alike we are. Life is life. We're strong and tall in our years, but showing the marks of time, 
you with your gnarled bark, me with my wrinkled skin. I wonder if your tree hurts as my body aches. We're not pretty and smooth anymore. Younger ones around us have the beauty and the delicacy of youth. Smooth, innocent bark, baby soft skin. But oh, how wise we are. And in our size and age, we provide protection, the shelter, the shade, so necessary to life and growth of these sweet young things. Fallen trees catch my eye. They fall indiscriminately, affecting the growth of those around them. And how is this different from human life where behavior of others shapes our destiny? O oh, tree, how I've how I've learned about life in talking with you. We're young, we're old. We're born, we die. We live and we're affected by those around us. Not just you and me, but all living things. It's just the way it is. If there's, if there's anybody else who would like to share a story or who would like to speak, um, we're done with what we had planned to do and everyone's welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, if I knew I was going to have such a tough act to follow, I might have reconsidered. <laughs> but anyway, I'm Arlene Fine, and I am one of the Canasta Nine. We met, I met Lori when we took Canasta lessons about eight years ago, and the rest is history. We were all part of, at a point in life, that we were interested in broadening our horizons, and broaden we did, and Lori was our leader. We were a fairly diverse group spanning three decades in various suburbs. Roberta, one of our nine, was Lori's neighbor and persuaded Lori to take Canasta lessons. And she shortly became our biggest cheerleader. She jumped right in and kept us organized. The lessons ended and we continued playing every Monday. Lori would take attendance, keep track of everyone's schedule, she found subs when we needed one, but most of all, she blossomed. She told us that prior to meeting us, she felt that life was somewhat routine, but once we all connected, she became a new person. When I would ask, do you want, she would immediately interrupt and say to me, yes, whatever you want to do, wherever you want to go, I'm in. She wanted to go everywhere and do everything. She loved us and we loved her. Life was good. In addition to us, her family was very dear to her. Her daughters, Donna and Carrie, who were wonderful to us, her grandkids, brother, sister, their families. She loved getting together with them, going to Michigan, and just being with family. She was also excited for anyone who had good news and very empathetic during difficult times. She was my best audience. She thought I was very funny. And I would say to her, but Lori, the rest of the world doesn't agree with you, <laughs> whatever. Um, I think that I may speak for everyone when I say that knowing Larry, uh, Lori made me a better person. And I have a, from, there are nine of us in the group, now eight. Four of us are here and four of us couldn't be here. One of the four who could not be here sent me a text which she asked me to read. She said to just let Lori da Lori's daughters know what a difference Lori has made in my life. This is from Marcia. I met Lori by accident at a place where seniors play her favorite game. And as soon as she said, I am looking for ladies to sub in my Canasta game, I was hooked. There was something about her wonderful smile an easygoing demeanor that I knew this stranger would become my friend forever. 
glory brightened my day when we got together for cards twice a week or talking on the phone or getting together over the summer in my backyard. May she rest in peace knowing how loved she was by so many. Marcia. Thank you. Checking if there's anybody else. I have six pages of notes from my mom's friends, but I think we're going to keep those to ourselves. <laughs> um, we want to thank everyone who was able to make it here today in person and everybody who attended on Zoom to help us celebrate our mother's life. It was our mother's wish to be cremated, and thus there will be no burial service following this. Our intention is, in her words, to sprinkle her in all of her favorite places on Mother's Day. After some discussion, we've also decided not to hold Shiva, given current safety considerations. But please know that all of your stories and the words of love to us and for our mother have been overwhelming. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for being here to help celebrate her life. She wanted to be here too, and I'm, I'm sure that she, uh, she's very thankful for everybody who came. So thank you. What beautiful words from everyone. We conclude with the mourner's Kaddish. I ask you to rise. Yitkadal v'yikadash mirabha Yalma divrach yurute v'yamlich machute Chayechon of Yomechon, Chayed of Hol Beit Yisrael, Vagalav Isman Kariv Yimuramein, Yehesh Me Rabba Mavarach Leolam O Meomaya, Yit Barach Vishtabach Vit Paar Vit Ruman Vit Nase, Vit Adar Vit Ale Vit Alal Shmeid Kurishah Brichu, Leilam in Kolbir Chatav Shirata, Tush Bechatav and Echamata, Damiran Bialma Vimuramein. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya, Chayim Aleinu V'al Kol Yisrael V'imramein. Ose Shalom B'imramav, Hu Ya'ase Shalom. Aleinu V'al Kol Yisrael V'imru. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the services here at the chapel. Memorial contributions in her memory to the St. Jude's Children Research Hospital or PetSmart Charities would be appreciated. For those of you who are here, that's in the service folder. And for those of you online, you can find that information on our website. We thank all of you for joining us, be it in person or online. You may return to your cars. <laughs>